are coming to you live from Purdue University with our show Zip Trips Dawn or Doom. I'm Jessica, your Purdue Zip Trip Guide. So why Dawn or Doom? What does that mean? Well, it's a fact that emerging technologies promise to bring a new dawn of safety and improvements to society. But sometimes they also have unforeseen consequences. In this Zip Trip, we will talk to scientists who are on the cutting edge of important issues and will be looking at what their research is as well as its implications. Now we have students all over the country watching this broadcast today. We also have a classroom joining us electronically today from Peru Peru High School, and I believe that they will be joining us later in today's show. Now, while we cannot see all of you out there, today's Zip Trip is interactive and you have a chance for your voice to be heard. If you have any questions for any of our scientists throughout today's program, just email them to us at ziptrips at purdue.edu. And today we are using a technology called Purdue Hot Seat, and it is hot, let me tell you, to take student questions. So everyone say hello to our Hot Seat correspondent, Abby. Hi, Abby. Hi, everyone. Hot Seat is a social media program that lets students use computers, cell phones, or other mobile devices to post questions and vote on the ones they would like to see asked on the show. We have 365 students in nine schools in the Hot Seat today. The schools are Clay High School in South Bend, Indiana, Riley High School in South Bend, Indiana, Rivet Middle School in Vincennes, Indiana, Southmont High School in Crawfordsville, Indiana, Zionsville Community High School in Zionsville, Indiana, St. Pope John Paul II Home School in Cherville, Indiana, Decatur Middle School in Indianapolis, Indiana, Holy Nativity School in Panama City, Florida, and a home school in Carmel, Indiana. You can get started by going to topic number one to post and vote on the questions for your first scientist. Well, thanks, Abby. Now, we do look forward to hearing from those schools throughout today's program. And first, we are going to meet a scientist whose specialty is our water supply and water security and how to protect the quality of water in the future. Then we will meet a Purdue scientist who leads a team researching how to keep the food you eat safe from harmful microorganisms. And finally, we will work with a Purdue scientist who is studying genetic modification in animals and what the implications are for human beings. So get ready to meet some scientists as we plunge into this fascinating zip trip, dawn or doom. So today we are looking at issues with uncertain futures and new research that offers hope in dealing with them. One of these serious issues is water, having plentiful, clean, high quality water to grow enough food to feed the world. And one of the scientists working on this crucial issue here at Purdue is with us today, Jane Frankenberger. Hi Jane, how are you today? I'm doing well, thanks for having me. Oh well, thank you for being here. Now Jane, before the break I mentioned that your work is about water supply and water security. Can you tell us what that means exactly? Well, we all use water every day, and the water supply is where we get that water from rivers or reservoirs and groundwater. Uh, water is critical for um, drinking, also for washing, and also for industry and agriculture. So water security mm -hmm. is ensuring that we have enough water for our needs and also that it's not contaminated so that it's clean enough to use. Got it. Well, I've been hearing a lot about droughts over the past few years. Is this an example of one of the threats to our water supply and security? 
Yes, definitely. Um, drought is when there's a water shortage due to a lack of precipitation. And fortunately, we don't have droughts too often in places like Indiana, mm -hmm. but they do occur. And unfortunately, they're probably going to occur more often due to climate change. And how big of a problem is climate change? How does, how does that become a problem for water supply and security? Well, the, the earth is warming and that changes the water vapor in the atmosphere. So that changes the precipitation patterns. Mm -hmm. So in general, in this area, we're probably gonna have just as much precipitation, but it won't fall at the times that we need it. So in times of the year, like winter and spring, when we already have too much water, we're gonna get even more water. And in the, the summer, when sometimes we don't have enough water, we're probably gonna get less. And more of the precipitation is going to fall in intense storms um, that cause flooding rather than soaking into the soil as we'd like. So how big of a problem is this for our agriculture? Well, agriculture is um, a very important industry and U.S. cropland is some of the most productive in the world. Mm -hmm. um, but even with our really good soils, we need precipitation at the right times. So if there's not enough um, water in the summer, it's a problem. And mm -hmm. if there's too much water in the spring, it is a problem. Now farmers deal with that um, already through drainage. Drainage, so how do they use drainage? What does that mean? Well, our, our farmland, people don't always see this, but there's a whole network of underground pipes that have been installed about three feet under the ground and carry water off so that the sto soil stays drained so that farmers can get in in the spring and, and allow crops to grow better. Very cool. Now, I hear that you are part of a research team working on this very subject. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, we have a large project that goes across eight states, all the way from North Dakota and South Dakota in the West and Missouri and through Indiana and over to Ohio. So the whole oh, Midwest wow. is included together. And we're carrying out research projects that are similar so that we can develop ways to deal with the problem of too much water or not enough water um, in ways that um, will allow us to develop solutions that farmers can use. Sure, so are all of the members on your research team scientists? Well, many are agricultural engineers, like myself, because okay. we're working on engineering solutions, um, but we also have agronomists, those scientists that study crops, and soil scientists and economists to figure out how the, the economics work as well. So working together with this interdisciplinary team um, allows us to test solutions that can work across the region and that can also um, consider all the different aspects of a new practice. So Very it's cool. a great opportunity to work together. Yeah, so What's the overall goal of your team? Your well, team. we call the project Transforming Drainage because our, our big goal is to change the, the, the way that drainage is currently done, which is to take the water off. As soon as it falls, they, they tend to put it in the stream. Mm -hmm. That's been the, the old way. Um, but hopefully in the, the new way, there will be more storage of water in the landscape. And this will help our, our landscapes be more resilient to climate change by um, having water available when it's needed and reducing the amount of excess water that can add contamination in our streams. Very cool. Well, I'm being told that our um, remote school, Peru High School, is now with us. So let's say hi to them really quickly. Let's go ahead and check in with them. Okay. Peru, are you guys there? Hi. Hi. Hello. Oh, there you are. Can there you, you are. wave? <laughs> hey, guys. Well, welcome to the show. Um, remember, if you have any questions, for today's scientists, please think of them and then we will call on you and check back in here shortly, okay? We'll see you soon. Okay. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. All right, so back to uh, water supply and security. So you were talking about drainage. What are the various ways that this can be done? Well, to understand what our research is leading to, you first need to understand that typical Indiana farmland like this mm -hmm. has sort of a plumbing system underground, as I said. Um, there's a network of plastic pipes that are about three feet um, under the ground. Okay. And um, they about 50 feet apart, and they carry the water that's drained off into um, the stream. And we usually call them tile drains. Now also in this picture, you see the blue area um, down below the drains, and that so shows that the soil is saturated, and while the area above the drain is drier. Now when it's a nice sunny day, this network of drain tiles doesn't need to do anything, it just sits there. But when it rains, they start working. 
as the rain soaks into the ground, it picks up nitrate from the soil and fertilizer, which you can see here as the little balls marked yeah. NO3. <clears throat> so when the soil becomes saturated, water starts to flow into the drains. Um, first it flows in the smaller drains in the field, then into the larger drains that carry the water to the stream. And all the water that's draining then has a high nitrate level, which can cause water quality problems downstream. When it stops raining, the drains continue to remove excess water in the soil until uh, the, the water table falls back below the drains and then they'll stop flowing. Now, one of the ways that, um, one of the practices that we're working on to reduce nitrate is to hold back some of the drains, the, the drained water in a practice called controlled drainage. Hmm. And farmers can install water control structures, as you see here, which really dam up the drain so that the water stays in the soil longer. And then when it rains, the soil becomes saturated and the, the drains start flowing, but now the water that contains nitrate, as always, builds up behind the dam. And when it stops raining, the water table stays at the level of the dam instead of going back down to the drain level. And keeping the soil saturated like this reduces the total drain flow so less nitrate gets into the stream. Okay. Another way to reduce drains is making some changes to the buffer, which is the grassy area uh, next to the stream, as you see here. Mm -hmm. Now, buffers are all often put in to benefit water quality by capturing soil erosion, which is carried by water over the drain. But they don't do anything for the nitrate, which is carried through the drains, as you see there. So to reduce nitrate, we can also put in the water control structure and then something called a, um, a pipe that's a distribution line mm -hmm. to allow the buffer to treat the water. So this is called a saturated buffer. Okay. So the, the, the drain line carries water out from the main tra drain line. And as before, when the rain falls and the soil becomes saturated, um, the, the water with nitrate in it um, is carried now into the, the drain tile, the, the distribution line, and here's where the saturated buffer starts to work. So bacteria in the soil can transform the nitrate in the water into N2 gas, which is very common and harmless. In fact, N2 gas is the most common element in the atmosphere. Sure. This process, which is called denitrification, reduces uh, water quality problems downstream. And a third way that we're working on to treat nitrate is to hold it into a pond and put it back into the field where it's useful instead of flowing downstream where it's harmful. So here, when it, when it rains, the soil becomes saturated and the drains flow. Now they flow into a pond rather than directly into the stream. And so the nitrate in the drain water stays in the pond rather than going into the streams or rivers. Um, later in the summer, there's often times when we don't have enough rain and the crops could use more. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we can irrigate the water that's stored in the pond back onto the field. And this helps the crop by adding water to the soil. And it also helps because the nitrate in the water is useful for the crops, even though it's harmful in the stream. So this is called drainage water recycling because mm -hmm. it puts the nitrate and the water back on the field, which helps crops and water quality. Very cool, so it's almost like recycling the nutrients. Yes, and I'm sure that most of the students watching today are in favor of recycling. <laughs> I know I am. Now, I'm sure most of us had no idea that this kind of water management existed. I just thought that you planted crops and then you just hoped it rained. But I guess I was wrong, right? <laughs> yes, well, we can always do better. And um, the, there are environmental um, benefits of doing this. Cool. And I, I hope that was emphasized by the nitrate in the water. So nitrate, when it gets into our rivers, um, causes a couple problems downstream. One, if cities are using it for drinking water, mm -hmm. it can be harmful. And there are some cities that are spending millions of dollars to take nitrate out. Got and it. then the, the bigger one is that when it gets to the oceans, nitrate causes eutrophication and then a zone of low oxygen. So in the Gulf of Mexico, there's a large area where fish can't live that's due to our drained agricultural landscapes here in the Midwest. Oh, wow. And it would be very difficult for them to take the nitrate out because there's so much water. So it's better if we can take the nitrate out before it gets into the rivers. 
Wow. That's eye-opening and such an important issue too. Now we will be hearing about more ways to solve growing problems later in our show, but right now let's go ahead and check back in with Peru High School. You guys think of any questions for Jane? Peru, who has a question for Jane? Hi. Yeah, we have a couple. Okay, can you uh, just start with one? What would happen if this pipe system failed? Oh, that's a very interesting question. It's it's not under pressure, so it's not like a water system mm -hmm. that, that could fail and could, could burst. Um, it's empty a lot of the time, so we don't usually have failures, but they can implode in and then um, farmers can go in and repair them. So it's not too difficult to fix. Good. It's an interesting question though. Well, for our schools in the hot seat, go to the poll and vote. We are interested in which of the benefits of Jane's research is most important to you. Which one? Jane, can you walk them through the options? Okay, the options are increased economic prosperity for farmers who won't lose crops because of drought, Okay. less damage to the environment, or increased food production. Okay, and which one is the most important to you at Peru High School? Let's check back in with them. Which one is the most important to you? The first one. The first one? Okay. okay, and before we comment on that, let's go back to the hot seat. Abby, what did they vote for? The hot seat users have voted for increased food production. Okay. Jane, do you have any comments on those answers? Well, or it was thoughts? really a matter of opinion because all sure. three are important. So the Peru students brought up the fact of, of um, reducing the potential for drought, and that's really similar to the increased food production that we can get through irrigation. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's the advantage if these technologies can work well, and I guess, again, we're still researching, sure. um, but that we can hopefully get all three benefits so that um, people will really be encouraged to do this and reduce the environmental benefits at the same time. Okay, I let's, let's uh, bring it back to Peru High School and see if you guys have any other questions for Jane while we have you. Any, any questions? How often are the plastic pipes changed? Oh, oh not very often. Question. That is an interesting question. Um, we Usually they don't need to be replaced. The only change that they make is maybe add more. Okay. Um, plastic pipes have been around since the 1960s. Before that, there were clay pipes, and they've been put in for more than 100 years. And some of them still exist, although they've been needing to be replaced now that they're 100 years right. old. But the plastic pipes are certainly going to last um, probably 50 years or, or more. This is very sturdy, and they don't get a lot of wear. Cool. Now let's go ahead and check in with Abby in our hot seat what questions have come in for Jane Abby the hot seat question of the moment is how much is Indiana and the rest of the Midwest in danger of water issues either overuse or undersupply compared to other parts of the country or even the world Oh, that is a good question. And in general, I think we've been a little complacent because here in Indiana, we're in the wetter part of the Midwest, we have had very reliable um, water. So we have to think of being fortunate, being blessed all these years. So we're in, I'd say, less da um, danger, if that was it. There's less of a concern here than in most other areas because our rain has fallen very regularly. Um, but that's why the concern around climate change is that this may not continue as much into the future. As it becomes warmer, there will be more evaporation and so we need more water to, to keep growing. So I think many more people are starting to look at the threat of drought and how we can um, do, do actions now to be more resilient to it. Okay. Hot seat users, don't forget to switch to topic two for the next scientist. And we also just got some email questions uh, all, from all over the country come in for you. So I'll just choose one. Uh, this is from Nav Navea in Kokomo, Indiana. Why are we growing short on water? Isn't water a renewable resource? Yeah, that's very well well put. <laughs> and um, yes, I, it's absolutely right. And the water is, of course, cycling around. We're still using the same water that the dinosaurs drank, as people often say. So the water is not going away. But um, one is that with a warmer climate, more can be in the atmosphere instead of in the soil. Um, but the other is that the changes for the, the climate are making the whole, the whole system a little bit less stable. And so the worry is that we'll get just as much water, but it won't come slowly just when it benefits the crops the most. It will come in intense storms. And so people are just as concerned about more flooding as they are about more drought. And that's the unfortunate um, 
what we're looking for under climate change. Well, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today. I know I've learned a lot in this short segment, and we will be checking back in with you and all of our scientists at the end of the show. So remember, email questions to us at ziptrips at purdue.edu. This looks pretty good. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So. Mm, what about this menu? What are you gonna get? Hi. What can I get everybody today? I'll have the listeria. All right. It's very good today. I'll have the salmonella salad. All right. That's one of my favorites. I will have a big bowl of E. coli. <laughs> appetizing. Lunch anyone? Well, figuring out where foodborne illness starts is never that easy. Despite ever-increasing productivity and modernized food production techniques, each year an estimated 48 million Americans get seriously sick because of contaminated food. And I mean really sick. Sometimes they even die. It's estimated that the cost of medical treatment, lost productivity, and death caused by contaminated food is over $55 billion. And the scariest part is, usually we have no clue where the contamination came from. So today we will be talking to a scientist specializing in food safety and microbiology. She is one of the scientists on the leading edge of research on this very serious subject. Joining us live is food scientist Haley Oliver. Hi, Haley. Good morning, Jessica. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here today. So can you tell us about where you are? Oh, I am standing in the middle of my laboratory in Nelson Hall in the Department of Food Science here at Purdue University. Now, Haley, I know your work is about food safety. Can you define what food safety means? Food safety means that we're studying and preventing food from being contaminated with bacteria that can cause disease, chemicals that could also cause disease, and things that are, we call physical hazards, like glass oh. um, or bone shards by accident that find their way into food that could actually do something like break your tooth or puncture your stomach. Oh my goodness, sounds pretty serious. Wouldn't be good. No, now I've, I've heard of food poisoning. I've actually experienced that several times myself. And you know that's when people get sick for maybe a short period of time. Is that what we're talking about here? Well, you can be short for a short period of time. Uh, most of us that are generally usually healthy, it might only last 24 hours, maybe three days. Uh, but there are some instances where foodborne disease can last several weeks and even lead to other complicated diseases and even death, which of course is the scariest part of foodborne illness. Very scary indeed. So what are some of those organisms that you're, you're talking about? So some of the things that the leading cause of foodborne illness in the United States is actually norovirus. You've also maybe heard it called cruise ship disease. Um, also Listeria monocytogenes and Salmonella. And in our lab, we work a lot with Listeria monocytogenes and Salmonella. And so what, where do you uh, look for these types of organisms? So in my lab group, my graduate students and I look for Listeria monocytogenes and Salmonella in what we call retail food systems. So you can imagine that food can go through a very complicated lifestyle from primary production at the farm all the way to finding its way to your refrigerator. Well, my group focuses on post-manufacturing, so on its way to the grocery store, the life that it has in the grocery store right before you purchase it and take it home. Got it. Well, did you guys know that statistics show that over the past 10 years, fresh and refrigerated food sales have grown by 20%. Now, it seems like some stories of serious food contamination are increasing in number. Are these, these two things related? Well, what we do know is that there has been a steady number of foodborne illness cases in the United States for several years. So the unfortunate news is we haven't made a lot of progress. 
and pr that is probably due to the fact that we've changed our diets in the last few years, as you've mentioned. We've switched over to um, foods that are less processed or that don't have what we call a kill step. So leafy greens, for example, they're triple washed, um, but it doesn't mean that we're actually going to eliminate all of the potentially dangerous bacteria that might accidentally be on those products. And so as we consume more of these higher risk foods in, in, by way of safety and not necessarily quality or nutrition, we do increase our exposure to the potential of foodborne pathogens. That gives us a pretty good picture of the problem. Now, we're all eating this food and no one likes the thought of it being contaminated. I know I don't. No. Um, and you are bringing some of the newest, most cutting edge technology and science to this problem. Is that right? That's right. So here in my lab group, you know, we're looking at, we're trying to fill in data gaps in our understanding of where foodborne illness sources actually come from. And it's why we work in retail and retail grocery stores, just trying to understand what role those play in potentially transmitting foodborne disease to humans. And so we do a process called environmental sampling. Um, we take sterile sponges, they look a lot like your house kitchen sponge, um, but we go out into the environment and we swab surfaces that are food contact surfaces and non-food contact surfaces to look for listeria and salmonella. So a food contact surface would be something like a cutting board or a countertop or maybe even a deli slicer. A non-food contact would be something like a floor drain or really anything from the knees down. Sure. We're trying to find those pathogens and see how they might find their way into foods. And so what are some of the benefits that you're seeing with this technique? So by understanding what's going on in the environment around foods, we're better able to work and inform retailers, so grocery stores, food safety managers, where their potential problems might be mm -hmm. so that they can improve sanitation or change how they, they do some of their practices in order to prevent that possible transmission into the foods that you'll be buying. Okay, and so when you collect these samples, what do you do with them? So when we collect the samples, they come back to the lab. We, they're just, again, they look like household sponges. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're nothing fancy. We even call them sponge sickles, which I think is really kind of funny at the end of the day. <laughs> nothing you'd really want to eat, I suppose. But um, we add media to them, uh, and media being uh, what the bacteria eat. We grow them to high numbers, and then we put them in a machine, which is right behind this camera, <laughs> you can probably hear it humming in the background, uh -huh. that actually goes through the samples after we've grown the bacteria to high levels to actually look specifically for the pathogens. So that can help an individual restaurant or grocery store, but how does this help in the bigger picture? So we're looking, we're partnered with 30 different retail stores all over the country, and we've been in well over 100 now looking for challenges and also looking for who does things right or what is it that constitutes right. So bigger picture, what we're going to be contributing is taking worst case scenarios complemented with best case scenarios so we can report to industry what the best practices are so that those can be implemented across industry to systematically improve food safety. Wow. Well, it's amazing how genomics and DNA can be used to improve gr this growing problem like food safety. Absolutely. And we, we are using technologies like whole genome sequencing and DNA fingerprinting. So you've probably seen it on CSI. Well, we do it right here in this lab because we want to know if it's the same bacteria over time. Um, if it's something that's transient, so a visitor to a store, mm -hmm. then we know that it maybe came in on someone's shoes or maybe some food products, but sanitation cleaned it away. We use whole genome sequencing and DNA fingerprinting to understand if that bacterium that we've recovered when we do s uh, environmental sponge sampling is a resident. So an, a bacterium that has set up residence in that environment and is staying long term, which means that it could be constantly contributing to risk of foodborne illness. It's like that, you know, relative who stays on your couch for, they That's say they're right. going to be here for three days That's and then it ends right. up being three months, right? Fish and, was it fish <laughs> and, and relatives? No good after three days. <laughs> well, Haley, let's, don't go away yet because we're going to check in with Peru High School and see if they have any questions for you, okay? Be right back. Peru, do you guys have any questions for Haley? Yes. What are some techniques that have recently been developed to prevent food pathogens? Can you repeat the question for me, Jessica? What are 
are some ways, some techniques that have recently been developed to prevent food pathogens. Were you able to hear it? I, I wasn't, Jessica. Oh, Could you repeat that sorry. for me? Not at all. Can you repeat it one more time, then? What are some technologies that have recently been developed to prevent food pathogens? Oh, that's a great question. So the question is, what are the, some new technologies that have been developed um, to detect foodborne pathogens? Yes. So that's one of the, actually one of the big um, missions here in Purdue Food Science is developing new detection methods that are faster and more accurate. Um, one of those systems is called the BEAM. So it's a combination of using engineering and microbiology to more quickly detect pathogens. Probably the technology that's going to be the most influential, though, in the next five years, and, and you'll get to see this in the news if you're, if you're watching and following any of the food recalls, is that whole genome sequencing actually is going to be the major driver. So understanding at a much higher resolution what organisms are where, what genes they have, if they're antibiotic resistant, and if they're actually the ones that are causing disease. It's going to be very, very interesting in the next couple of years. Nice thorough answer. Thank you, Haley. Now, uh, let's go ahead and check in with Abby to see what hot seat questions have come in for you. Abby. The hot question of the moment with 22 votes is, how is the process of fresh produce in meats changing the probability of foodborne illnesses? And would genetically modified organiz organisms be more or less likely to give you these foodborne illnesses? Well, with the, the passing of the Food Safety Modernization Act in 2011, that has really changed some of the demands on production, all the way from farm to fork, so all the way to the consumer when it comes to fresh produce safety. So there are many more policies in place and much more record keeping that's going to have to be done by producers, again, from farm all the way to the point of sale at the consumer so we can trace it and so we understand better how those um, how those products were produced so we can also better understand their risk. As far as meat safety is concerned, um, that actually doesn't have anything to do with what we call FSMA or the Food Safety Modernization Act. That's regulated by the USDA. Um, some of the things that are coming down the pipeline um, as far as meat safety is concerned, what's going on in Washington DC right now is actually discussions of whether or not to make salmonella an adulterant. And what that means is it is currently it's legal. It's completely legal to find salmonella in raw chicken because it's a part of that chicken's natural normal flora. It's part of its normal bacteria. But we see high levels of it in some instances. And so there is discussion going on about changing some of the policies of how, whether the presence or absence of those organisms could be present in food. With respect to genetically modified organisms, there really is no data, um, to my knowledge, that demonstrates at least a, a food safety risk. And again, we're talking about biological, chemical, or physical hazards, but that's something that we'll have to look to in the future. Very good. Thanks, Haley. Now, don't forget to switch to topic three in the hot seat for the next scientist. Well, thanks for being here with us, Haley, and we will check back in with you at the end of the show for more questions and answers, okay? Sounds good. Thank you.
that was a little bizarre. With us now is Purdue scientist Bill Muir. Bill is a geneticist and professor in the Department of Animal Science at Purdue University. Welcome to the show, Bill. Good morning, Jessica. I'm very happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you. Now, Bill, you're here today to talk, to to talk about a very important topic. What is that? Genetic engineering. Genetic engineering is the direct modification of DNA that encodes for the molecules of life. Okay, that sounds amazing, but also a bit ominous. We probably should start by defining what is gene editing, and is that the same thing as genetic engineering? Well, genetic engineering is a very general term, and it can be broadly broken down into two classifications. One is what we call cisgenics, and the other one's transgenics. Okay, cisgenic. What does cisgenic mean? Well, cisgenic is probably the, the lesser of the concerns. Um, it's moving alleles of genes from one breed of a species to another breed. Okay, and can you give us an example of cisgenics? Sure. One of the, the best examples occurred recently in cattle where they're dealing with the issue of horns mm -hmm. because horns, as most people know, are very dangerous. And sure. They can not only kill or horn or harm or kill the handlers, but other animals too. They, they inflict uh, damage on, on each other, sparring and fighting. And so horns are normally removed from the calves on birth, and it's a very bloody and painful process, oh. both for, I think, the calf and the person doing it. Oh, sure. I don't think anybody wants to wants do to it. Wants to do that. No right. way. So what they were able to do was um, there's some cattle that are born without horns. These are called polled, and the gene was, was cloned in Belgium blue, and we were able to move the allele for that clone into, say, Holsteins, so that now the Holstein calves are born without horns. And the oh. amazing thing about this is that we're able to do this within a few years. We're very able to move it very rapidly from one breed to another. The same thing could have been done with conventional breeding, but we would have had to back cross for several generations in order to get a Holstein cow back out of crossing it to a Belgian blue to get you know high milk production. That could take over 50 years to do. So we're able to do this very quickly and efficiently using uh, cisgenics. Well, that sounds very promising. So that's cisgenics. Let's right. talk about transgenics now. What is transgenics and can you give us an example of that? Sure, transgenic uh, is the more, uh, people are more concerned about transgenics because now we're moving genes between species. So we can move things all the way from bacteria to cattle. Um, there, there's no limit to where we can move genes from any species to any other species. Mm -hmm. And so you brought an example of this, right? Yes, I brought the glowfish. The glowfish oh. is a, uh, they're, they're in the pet stores. It's a pet meant to. Let's, let's bring the lights down, guys. There we go. They, the um, in, in, a, in the aquarium industry, uh, as most people know, it's very difficult to maintain saltwater tanks because, you know, you have to be, maintain the, the salinity very carefully. And so we moved the genes for color fluorescent color from sea coral to freshwater fish, the zebra daniel and the uh, tetras. So now you can have essentially the color of a saltwater fish and a freshwater fish. And these are, it was the first commercially available animal on the market in the United States or any place in the world that I know of. Wow, it sounds like a great nightlight. Okay, let's bring the lights up guys. <laughs> so that really shows that transgenics transgenics can be done, but now can you tell us why it's done? What are the benefits of transgenics? Well, uh, you might think of the, the glowfish as being somewhat frivolous use of the technology just to, to make a pet, but it's a really good demonstration, you know, and, and it's a company, they're out to make money mm -hmm. and make a product, but also uh, we need to think about using transgenics and this technology to feed the world. Sure. And one of the first the second animal to be approved, or actually it's the first animal to be approved for human consumption, is the Aqua Bounty Aqua Advantage salmon, where they moved a gene for growth hormone into the salmon that makes them grow twice as fast. In this way, they're able to uh, double the rate of, of growth so we can get twice as many uh, fish out of, the mar out of the growing facility in the same amount of time, and also because they grow faster and more feed efficient. So they convert um, less feed into more fish. So this, this, is, this is addressing the, a very important topic about uh, we have a growing, expanding population and we need to feed the world. And this is one of the, the ways that we can use transgenics to improve food production. Now I want to know, do the fish taste the same? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, I don't know of anybody who's actually eaten these fish yet, but the FDA has done very careful analysis of the food 
before they uh, were before they gave the approval okay. that they could be as consumed and very careful toxicology allergens uh, food content was all analyzed to be sure that the uh, genetically modified fish are no different in food composition than what you're used to eating and they have no new allergens so i'm sure they'll taste exactly the same as the fish you're used to eating i would not be concerned about eating them i would eat them i would not be concerned if my family ate them Okay. Well, so what if what would happen if one of these fish got out into the wild? Oh, that's a really great question. Actually, that was the question that regulators were most concerned about. It it took almost 25 years for these fish to reach market. Wow. And actually the food safety concerns was the easiest question to address because we can address that using standard scientific methods, but environmental safety is a much bigger issue. And this is the actual the area of my research is I'm a population geneticist and I wanted to know, can we predict what would happen to a uh, genetically modified organism if it were released into the wild or if it escaped or if somebody you know, purposely <laughs> did it? Yeah. Um, what is the fate of this and is it gonna cause ecological disruptions, gonna display, display species and we're gonna have you know, some catastrophe, which is, is a real concern. And so we, we were able to measure the fitnesses of these fish and in general, we found that the fitness was much reduced, both of the glow fish and of the aqua advantage fish. It's, it has a much lower survival rate in the wild. So if it does get loose, it will very rapidly be purged from the environment just by natural selection. Because wow. that's what nature does all the time. Sure. It's always testing new genes. And if they're not more fit than what already exists, it gets rid of them. Survival of the fittest. That's right? it. Yes. Or most fit. Whichever you choose. So, um, <laughs> are there speaking of, of the environment? Are there any em environmental benefits to transgenics? Yes. So, transgenics can be used to address any almost any of the concerns of, of production, agriculture, or of medicine. Uh, one of the, the greatest examples I can think of is what we call what was called the Enviro pig. Okay. And an Enviro pig, we we moved a gene from a bacteria to the the gut of the animal itself. It expresses in the gut. And what it does is it breaks down phytic acid. And phytic acid is a uh, phosphorus storage molecule that's in present in seeds that most is generally indigestible. It mm -hmm. passes through you, or through pigs, onto, into their waste stream. And in the waste, these microorganisms can break it down into elemental phosphorus. This phosphorus then can run off into lakes and streams and cause eutrophication, uh, algae blooms, and fish death, and so it causes environmental pollution and it's a problem. Hmm. So uh, by moving this gene from the bacteria into the pig, it moves it up one stage in the process of where the phosphorus degradation occurs, and now the pig can directly use the phytic acid as their phosphorus source for growth. And as a result, they, they are able to use something that's already in their feed, mm -hmm. so you don't have to add it. Right. And secondly, when they uh, the waste from these pigs don't produce pollution when it runs off or, you know, it's, it's, it's much less of an environmental concern. So this environmental pig is, is, a, is a huge win-win for both the farmers who now it's more economical to feed their pigs and also for society because in the environment in general because we're polluting less. A win-win indeed. So are there any benefits to human health oh, from oh transgenics? Yes. So, uh, a really great example is what well, is the human life design uh, example because uh, in many developing countries they don't have access to safe sterile clean water and very high infant mortality often occurs mm -hmm. as a result but um, most mothers know that um, and hospitals recognize that mother's milk lactating lactating women have naturally protect their offspring from a natural antibiotic that occurs in mother's milk, and it's called lysozyme. And this lysozyme essentially shreds the bacteria. That's what a, what a lysate is. Hmm. It shreds the cell coats and it kills bacteria in, in the milk. So if, if infants are naturally nursing, they're protected from bacteria during this time. But mothers can't keep on nursing forever. And a lot of, if you're on a poor diet, they can actually not be nursing at all. So moving this, this gene for lysozyme from humans that was cloned, they moved it into a goat. Huh. And the goat now can produce human lysozyme in goat's milk. Wow. It was moved to the goat because a goat, they know how to rear goats in developing countries. It's an animal that can live in a variety of environments and they know how to care and take care of them. 
So if we add goat's milk into the normal diet of infants, now we can reduce, greatly reduce infant mortality due to diarrhea. Wow. Yeah. Saving so human goat's health. milk can yes. be like a shield of armor for babies. Who yes. would have thought? Yes. And curing genetic illness, increasing fruit, food production, and reducing infant mortality in third world countries, those are all great. Well, thank you so much uh, for being here. But before you go, let's check in with Abby to see what's happening in the hot seat. Abby. The hot seat question of the moment is, a recent news story indicated a child was just revealed to have been born with the DNA of three people so that the child would not inherit a genetic disorder from the mother. What are the ethical and scientific impacts of this type of DNA editing? Um, I think that the story has been mixed up. Um, actually what happened was that um, the genetic defect was in the mitochondrial DNA which caused a mitochondrial disease. So they took the nucleus from the mother um, and put it into another uh, oocyte that, did, that had the recipient's RNA such that they did not have the disease. So this is not gene editing technology, it's not a uh, uh, genetic modification of any sort, it's simply moving the nucleus into the cytoplasm such that the cytoplasm has the correct um, RNA and they don't have the RNA disease. So that, you know, it raises some ethical concerns about dealing with human, uh, with humans, but we're not really modifying the DNA. I think this is an okay technology because we're just trying to improve reproductive success, mm -hmm. and we're not changing the genes of the individual. We're putting into it into a different, what we call maternal environment. Well, you have given us a lot to ponder today. Thank you for again for coming in, but stick around. Right after the break, we will be back with a Q and A session with all of our scientists. we've come a long way. Well, we hope you've had a great time meeting some real life scientists here at Purdue University for our Dawn or Doom Zip Trip and have learned some things too. Now we do have time for more of your questions for all of the scientists in today's show. So let's go to the hot seat first, Abby. The hot seat users have a question for Jane. They wanna know, do you think that the regulation of total maximum daily loads should be more strict or does the US Clean Water Act already deal with the main points of pollutants in our water? Wow, these are very sophisticated <laughs> question askers. So it's great that they brought up the Clean Water Act, which is the foundation of all our uh, water quality regulations since the early 1970s, and it's done so much to improve our water. Now the, the implementation now is partly through total maximum daily loads, mm -hmm. as this questioner said, which is one way to, um, the, sort of a budget of how much nitrate or other pollutants can go in and then they allocate them among the users. They haven't done 
too much as far as um, making substantial changes, I would say. So what the solution is, is maybe less clear, but I think we need to look back and, and think through possible um, implementation scenarios to make the Clean Water Act continue to do what it's supposed to do with the agricultural pollutants as well. So really good question. Very good. Uh, and we just got an email question for Haley. Uh, Haley. How can we, as non-scientists, prevent foodborne illnesses on our own? Oh, that's a... Or at least try to. <laughs> you can do your best, yeah. right? So the, the best thing that we can do, you know, if you're really worried about foodborne illness, especially if you're an at-risk population, so someone that's very young, very old, um, pregnant, or otherwise immunocompromised, maybe through chemotherapy, you really should think about the foods that you eat the, the best way to deal with it, honestly, is cooked foods. Hmm. So heat treatment um, and then not temperature abusing it, so immediately putting it in the refrigerator when you're done are two of the best strategies that you can use to manage your risk of foodborne illness. Got it. And let's go ahead and check back in with Peru High School for questions. Peru. Yes, I have a question for Bill. Do you think that it is ethical to change or remove the genetic qualities of an animal that you do not like for the benefit of humans? Can you give me an example? <laughs> um, like how you made the glowfish so that they would glow for human entertainment. Well, we moved the gene from uh, sea coral into the fish so now they glow. Um, I'm unsure of the, the, could you repeat the rest of the question? I'll just repeat the whole question. Okay. Do you think that it is ethical to like change or remove a genetic quality that is given to an animal just so it'll fit better with a human, like how you took the goats, you put in a genetic quality so it'd be better for humans, oh. but that wasn't originally given to the goat. Okay. So you're, what, you're, what your uh, question is, it goes to what we call it the, the uh, teleos. The, um, uh, it has to do with the character of the animal. Is it ethical for us to change the character of the animal because it no longer has the same character? Mm -hmm. And I would, uh, in answer to that, uh, we've already done that with non-GM technology. When we bred animals like chickens to produce more eggs or to grow faster or cows to give more milk, those don't exist in nature. They're very different. When you look at what's needed to survive in nature, is extremely different from what we need in production agriculture. So we're doing that all the time as a, as a result of the process of domestication. And as all the uh, GM technology allows us to do is to speed that up faster and actually produce greater changes. So I think that we, we as a society have accepted that we're going to change animals to feed populations of humans. Very thought-provoking questions, guys. Really good job today. And for the questions we were not able to get to, we will be sending out an email with the most frequently asked questions from today's show for teachers to review with students. Zip Trips will be back next spring. Good news. So watch your email and check the Zip Trips website for updates. Thanks to all of our students and scientists here in the studio and to all of you watching out there. We'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>